We have two texts in the beginning and end of the book of Revelation. It kind of begins and ends on comparable notes. So chapter 1, reading verses 1 through 3. <clears throat> the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show to his servants the things that must soon take place. He made it known, or he signed it, verbal word for signs. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear and who keep what is written in it, for the time is near. I'll turn, if you would, to the end of the Revelation as we conclude our exposition through it. I'll be reading verses 6 through 21. And he said to me, These words are trustworthy and true. And the Lord, the God of the spirits of the prophets, has sent his angel to show his servants what must soon take place. And behold, I am coming soon. Blessed is the one who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. I, John, am the one who heard and saw these things. And when I heard and saw them, I fell down to worship at the feet of the angel who showed them to me. But he said to me, You must not do that. I am a fellow servant with you and your brothers the prophets and with those who keep the words of this book. Worship God. And he said to me, Do not seal up the words of the prophecy of this book, for the time is near, that the evildoer still do evil and the filthy still be filthy and the righteous still do right and the holy still be holy. Behold, I am coming soon bringing my recompense or reward with me to repay everyone for what he has done. I'm the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Blessed are those who wash their robes so that they may have the right to the tree of life and that they may enter the city by the gates. Outside are the dogs and sorcerers and the sexually immoral and murderers and idolaters and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you about these things for the churches. I am the root and the descendant of David, the bright morning star. The spirit and the bride say, Come. And let the one who hears say, Come. And let the one who is thirsty come. Let the one who desires take the water of life without price. I warn everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. If anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues described in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God will take away his share in the tree of life and in the holy city which are described in this book. He who testifies to these things says, Surely I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with you all. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, how we thank you that you have given us your word that we may not fumble about, grasping about into the misty, foggy air of spiritual uh, reality. But you have spoken to us, you have revealed to us your word that we might know uh, of your salvation plan 
in Jesus Christ. And we thank you that we've come to this last book, this, this book of the culmination of your salvation plan, and for all we have received from it thus far. And we pray, Lord, that again you might, uh, as it is, uh, hit these seven nails on the head uh, that they might be driven into our hearts and that we might be ready for him who says he is coming soon. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, from the very opening of the book of Revelation, which we read, and, and in the middle, uh, a number of occasions, and now at the end, we are reminded that this book is a prophecy meaning that they are the words of God. That's what prophecy is. Prophecy is generally used in our common parlance as having to do with things future. And that certainly is a component of prophecy, but fundamentally that's not what prophecy is. Prophecy is what the prophet speaks. God says, I will put my word in the mouth of the prophet, and this is that word written that is the book of Revelation. It is a communication from God to his covenant people written on permanent file. And as such, uh, there is no doubt about it. The book itself tells us that it is to be read in the setting of worship. It's to be read by the angel of the church, which we've seen earlier that this has to do with the pastor of the church. That book is to be read, and the church is obligated, uh, when it is read, to come and gather, the word church means assemble, and to assemble to attend and li listen to the reading of that word. As it says repeatedly, uh, listen, uh, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. And not only are we to gather, to hear it read, and to listen when it is read, but we are to keep it. <clears throat> this is not optional. This is what the church does. This is what the church does arising out of her redemptive relationship with God through Christ. And to fail to show up to hear the word of God, the word of the covenant God read, is nothing less than an act of infidelity. I mean, can you imagine a few Israelites saying, go ahead to Sinai, I'm going to go out and play in the desert. I got an ATV this weekend on rent, so you guys go ahead to Sinai and hear God give his word, I'm going to play. I mean, you say that's ludicrous. That's well, exactly what is done in this day and age, though. Amazing, isn't it? It's a failure to respond to God's love. Do not come and hear him speak on his mountain when his word is read. And so not only is the book of Revelation a prophecy, but we've also learned the book of Revelation is a letter. It's a letter. He addresses God's people through, people through John the Apostle. And the fact that it is a prophetic letter highlights the fact of its divine authority, prophetic, but also its personal address. It's a letter to you. It's a letter intended for you to read as from God. You see the two sides of the covenant relationship. God, the covenant king, us, his covenant people. His word is spoke, it's put in letter form, addressed personally to us. Also, we have already seen, as we've just read, that the language of this letter is apocalyptic. It's apocalyptic in nature. It's a dramatic, intense, pictorial, and urgent letter. It's written in the context of conflict, and it's written in the context of very condensed time that just around the corner is the end. This letter has been read to this congregation in full now, as of today. And it has been expounded in part, except for today's completion, for your hearing 
and to respond now to its final pleas. And if you have the outline to the bullet or the in your bulletin to the message, you'll find it's seven final words. So let us lay it to heart, let us keep it and practice it in our lives because the stakes are not temporal in nature. They are eternal. So he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. First, these are words of bank. You've heard the saying, you can take this to the bank. That's an idiom that means not that I gave you some money and deposit it. It means that this is faithful stuff that will stand the scrutiny of the bank. <laughs> it will pass. <laughs> you can take it to the bank. And these words are words of bank. These, as it says in verse 6, are trustworthy and true words. The words of the prophets and of his angels. We are assured that the words of this book are faithful and true. So be absolutely sober about them. Nothing will fail in this book. All will come to pass, and those who embrace its message and persevere in it will live. That is the promise of this book, and we can bank on it. And those who just merely listen and go, oh, wow, that's really interesting, fascinating, oh man, that's so cool, and don't embrace it and keep it, they will perish. You can take it to the bank. It says it repeatedly in the book. It is meant, though, it is intended for blessing. Blessing. The well-being of its hearers, that's its intention. And so it is faithful and true. It does not fail to map out its storyline. And we have seen this, have we not? Uh, we have seen this principle of recapitulation in the book where the same territory is brought up repeatedly throughout the book to impress it deeply in our minds that it might reside there, whether it's from this angle, that angle, or that angle. Uh, the the, the storyline is a storyline uh, between the first and second comings of Jesus Christ, the culmination of redemptive history, that we might have these as it is riveted uh, to us. And so it's important for us to ask ourselves, are, am I in submission to the plan that is here? Am I walking in this plan or am I walking in my own plan? Uh, and that's the critical question once we are confronted with it. Uh, because repeatedly the point is made, behold, I am coming soon. So get ready, I mean, of course. Be prepared for it. It's the all things controlling now that Christ is on his way. Things hidden will be known. All subterfuge, all game playing, all deceit. All of it will be revealed. I am coming soon. Who will be blessed in that day? He tells us who will be blessed in that day. The one who keeps the words of this book will be blessed in this day with him whose reward is with him. And what does it mean to keep the words of this book? You know, it sounds kind of erudite. Oh, yeah, let's keep the words. Well, what, what is it exactly John wants us to keep? Can we isolate it? And I think we can, at least a few points, isolate what he's after. What it is he's telling us are faithful and true. We can bank on. Number one is we are to keep the reality of what the book is about. To gather. To listen to the red word of God. Number one. Number two, to clasp its message of Christ to our hearts of that word. Number three, to say no to the world's viewpoint. The tempting, temptress, prostitute, Babylon, the world, 
the alternate city. We are called to say no to her viewpoint, her ethics, her idols, and we are called to repent of our own indulgences, idolatries, and immoralities that we might come out of her, my people. See, that, believe it or not, that's where we start. Uh, we start in the fallen arena and we're, we're being called out of it uh, into the bride. Called out of idolatry and immoralities and the evils that are characteristics of fallen Babylon who's headed for judgment. To come out of her into Christ and into Christ to be identified as his bride. Fourthly, we are called to persevere. The very beginning of the book, chapter 1, verse 9, John speaks of the trial and of the kingdom and of perseverance. Each of the seven letters are an exhortation to persevere. That means it's going to be a rough ride, brothers and sisters. Christianity is not for wimps. It's not for those who want to kick back in the Cadillac of life and be very comfortably taken to your destination. No, it's, it's a rough ride. There'll be shrapnel, there'll be bullets flying overhead, and it's going to be difficult in this. We must persevere through it all, through suffering, through trial, that we, of course, at the very end, because we've kept our attention where it belongs, he is coming soon. And we hold on to the fifth one, the very end. So we must not only bank on the sobriety of these words, we must go to the bank with these words for our life and say, yeah, that's where my deposit is, truly. Secondly, uh, we come to the words of worship. Words, these are words of worship. In verse 8, it says, John, I, 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 John, am the one who heard and saw these things. And when I heard and saw them, I fell down to worship to the feet of the angel who showed them to me. And he, he said to me, you must not do that. I'm a fellow servant with you and your brothers and the prophets and with those who keep the words of the prophecy of this book. Worship God. This is the second time John is rebuked by the angel for incorrect worship in the, in, in the midst of it all. It's very easy to be self-deceived about proper worship. Even in receiving this message from the angel, like John himself, we can become very enthralled with the one who brings the message rather than with the message. And we can trick our own selves and have our favorite preacher that means everything to me. Not recognize it's just a vessel. We must worship a rite not just worship by impulse. It was John in the midst of all this amazing revelation. He, he, it was an impulsive response to worship that angel. I remember back in 1971, my very first pastor who baptized me with the Cadillac of all baptisms, triune communion, triune baptism, I mean, three times dunked under the water. I, I was definitely baptized. But... As dear as that pastor was to me and to that congregation, it was disconcerting to see when he took a call to go someone else that people left the church because Pastor Thomas isn't there anymore. Well, who are you worshiping, you see? They should have stayed to worship Christ, the message, not leaving because they had a secret allegiance to the messenger, this problem continues to this day. Our culture is a culture given to celebrity worship. This is the ethos that moves out of the culture and unfortunately into the church with excessive devotion and praise given to celebrity pastors. They aren't even prophets for crying out loud. 
Of course, some, unfortunately, make that ridiculous claim. So let's be absolutely sure to guard our deceitful hearts, to love Christ and his words supremely, and to worship him alone. Because as verse 12 says, he is bringing his reward with him. And what a horror, what a shame, what a shocking disappointment it will be when he rewards those who in reality did not worship him in truth, but were stuck on his messengers instead, taken away. By that, as verse 13 tells us, I am the Alpha and the Omega. I am the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Christ is the all-encompassing, eternal one, the source and culmination of redemptive history, the Alpha and the Omega. He should, the one, he's the sovereign eternal one that should have our attention and our affections and our allegiance and not to be derailed by unbiblical, excessive devotion to the instrument that he uses. We must be very careful. We're not easily derailed from worshiping God to in reality worship some other aspect of the divine instruments or counsel. It's all of us is to lead us upward to him to worship. And if John, his own apostle, can slip in this area, please let us not think somehow I'm insulated. <laughs> As D.L. Moody liked to say, the man I suspect most dwells under my hat. We should have great self-suspicion in this area. Be sure our attachment is to the giver, not the gifts. To the blesser, not the blessings. Worship God. This is the entire message of the book of Revelation. This is the scope of the whole, and this is the contribution of its parts. Worship God. Chapter 14, somewhat toward the middle of the very book itself, says, I saw an angel flying overhead with an eternal gospel to proclaim to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation and tribe and language and people. Fantastic. The gospel's preached. And he said with a loud voice, Fear God, give him glory, because the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him. He made heaven, the earth, the sea, and the springs of water. The gospel leads us directly from reconciliation to God with grateful worship gathering to hear from God. The entire message of the book. Of course, how should we worship him becomes a burning question. All right? It's one thing to say, worship him. How should I worship him? The very first step in worshiping God, according to his word, found here in the, not only the whole Bible, but particularly in the book of Revelation, is to worship with his people to hear his word. That happened on Sinai, and that's supposed to happen on Zion, too. To hear that word, to embrace it in faith and repentance and praise God in response to that word as we offer up sacrifice to him. The sacrifice, Romans 12, of our lives in response to Christ. And anything else than following what the Bible says on how to worship him is idolatry. So worship God. That's the word of John and the angel. Impulsive, self-deceptive worship is the warning. But thirdly, we have words here not only of words to take to the bank and of words of worship, but words of washing. Verses 14 and 15. Blessed are those who wash their robes that they may have the right to the tree of life, that they may enter the city by the gates, outside of the dogs and sorcerers and sexually immoral murderers, idolaters, and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. Your words of washing, this is again a, a, an ongoing, repeated theme in the Revelation. We are to wash ourselves, and therein we are blessed. 
Well, we read prior that the blessing are for those who keep the words of the prophecy. Okay? We are blessed if we keep the words of the prophecy. We are blessed if we wash our robes. Now you've got to ask yourself, well, now I'm confused. Which is it? <laughs> do I wash my robes? Or do I keep the words of the prophecy? You know, which, which way of blessing is it? And I think we need to be able to say that both of these, both washing and keeping, operate in a grace environment and are to be observed. We are to wash our robes. In chapter 7, verse 14, we find the worshiping saints in heaven are worshiping God and thanking Him uh, because they have washed their robes in the blood of the Lamb. And if you heard the salutation this morning, it was a salutation from the very beginning of the book of Revelation, built into the salutation. He has set us free from our sins by His blood. In chapter 5, we read of the blood of the Lamb that's redeemed from every tribe, tongue, language, and nation of the world, a people. Yes, we must find in Jesus, by faith alone, washing. And we must also find, by faith alone, as we stumble through this world, continual returns to the fountain. For washing. It's clearly, it's through Christ's work of shedding his blood. It is the only soul path to wash away. It's the only true potent solvent to wash us clean. From the very beginning of the book to its middle, now to its end, the theme is recapitulated and proclaim to us over and over again that the blood of Jesus sets his people free that they might be priests who worship. Not free to wander around, but free to worship with his people. The pattern in the Old Testament realized in the New. And not only free to worship, but free, set free to walk anew. To walk, to begin walking in this world upon streets of gold. We will walk in those streets of gold in the world to come, but it's something to begin already because we have the gift of the Holy Spirit for those who have been washed. But we also find that once we are washed, that issues in a new obedience. That means it issues in a keeping of the words. Cleansing you might think of the words of Jesus in, in Matthew 7, 14, that the gate is narrow, the, the way is narrow that leads to life. The gate is the cleansing into the way of life. The, the, the narrow road is the keeping of the words into that life. And then the conclusion is life itself, the tree of life, entering through the gates of the city into eternity. God not only justifies a people, cleanses and washes them from their sin, but leads them into newness of life out of and away from their sin. All of grace, of course. Grace is what makes the difference. It both cleanses and it empowers. It both claims a people for his own and transforms a people for his own. So there's no necessary dichotomy between Blessed are those who wash their robes, and blessed are those who keep the words of this prophecy. They go together. And outside, he says, of this washed, gated community that partakes of the river of life and the tree of life, he says, outside are the not blessed. Outside are those who retain and suffer under an eternal curse, as he says in verse 15. Ending, as he does in several other of these lists, with those who love falsehood. Those who love falsehood. Those who love falsehood, of course, is a suppressed reference to having membership in the church, but not possessing the very life 
stream of the church. Outwardly, yes, you're in, but inwardly, you're dry as a bone. You look one way or actually the other. Uh, we will not have that in the, in the world to come. All will be drinking truly of the streams of living water. And we'll say more about that shortly. But don't doubt it. Don't doubt it. Have you been washed? And because of it, are you walking anew in Christ? Fourthly, we have here in verse 16 the words of witness. The closing words of it. And of course, the book of Revelation is over and over again telling us that it is a testimony. This book has nothing less than divine and supernatural legal force. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify, witness to you about these things for the churches. I am the root and the descendant of David, the bright and morning star. What is the legal testimony that's here? The legal testimony is here is that the kingdom of God has come. He who was promised of the lineage of David has come. His kingdom is here. The very first words out of Jesus' mouth in his public ministry, you remember what they were? Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. Why did Jesus come? Jesus came to secure and to rule over a kingdom. He secured it through his perfect work because righteousness is absolutely necessary to obtain the kingdom of God. Always was absolutely necessary, both with Adam and with Israel. But Jesus is the one who secured it through his own righteousness. But now that having secured it, that kingdom is here. He's borne witness to its reality, even though you do not see Jesus sitting upon the throne of David right now. And if you do see Jesus sitting upon the throne of David right now, you're dead. And you've been gathered to his right hand. The spirits of just men made perfect. And in other claims to thinking you see the throne of Jesus Christ and him sitting upon it, or any revelation of Jesus Christ, is bogus by nature. But why do I believe it? Why do I embrace it? Why do I believe that Christ is in heaven on the throne of David in an eternal kingdom that cannot be shaken. Why do I believe that? <laughs> because God has brought testimony to you. In John chapter 5, you can read about a number of different testimonies. God doesn't leave it just one angle. He leaves a, a, a number of different angles that we might be confident that the invisible kingdom of God that now rules and reigns in the hearts of all his people is truly here and is being advanced, even as he who rides upon the white horse goes forth, goes forth conquering into conquer, because he gives adequate and necessary testimony to its reality. And that testimony leads us to believe that not only has the kingdom come and is here in power by the Holy Spirit, but that kingdom will come in its visibility and in its final judgment. As it says three times, just in this last few verses, I am coming soon. Yes, he is the lamb who has by his work secured the kingdom to make us a kingdom of priests with him. And he is also the lion. He is the lion who rules over that kingdom. Remember chapter 5, lion and lamb. So that kingdom, brothers and sisters, that is now hidden, he has testified to that we might know that even though I cannot see it with my visible eye in any sense of that word, I can see it with the eye of faith as that eye of faith is informed by the testimony of Scripture by the testimony of the Spirit, by the testimony of the angel to John, who prophetically wrote that word, by the coming of Jesus Christ into the world. Christ the King is the great morning star. That means the 
the emergence of a star of light in the morning. That's, that will be the new day. When Christ comes back, that will be a new day. That will be the first day when Jesus comes back of the new creation. It's called the last day. It's also the first day. It's the end of this world. It's the beginning of the new world, where its light of that kingdom will be the light of the Lamb. He is the king. He is that bright and morning star that the Old Testament prophesied of. And that bright and morning star, Peter says, if you hear his word and you believe it, that very star will rise up in your hearts ahead of time in this world. 2 Peter chapter 1. Fifthly, these are words of water. This water is royal water. We saw last week that these waters of life come from where? They come out from under the throne. They're they're kingdom waters that flow in to the lives of God's people, flowing from the throne that they might drink of these waters. And these waters are nothing less than the gift of the Holy Spirit who brings down from the throne of God, chapter 4, from the sea of crystal, these rivers to refresh the hearts and lives of God's people as they drink upon His gospel and receive of His Spirit into their souls. Real communion with Christ by the Spirit in these royal waters from heaven. And the truth of the matter is, everybody's thirsty in life. Everybody's thirsty and you're drinking something. Because you're the image of God. Because you're the image of God. When God is distant, you are thirsty. Now the question is, and this is the question of the book of Revelation, where are you going to get a drink? (laughs) You going to get a drink from some creaturely thing? That's the book of Revelation calls that idolatry. Are you going to Christ and the streams of water flowing from his throne through which you get your drink? Remember the Samaritan woman? Drank five men dry as a bone, cast them all aside, was drinking through number six, and who came along? Jesus, the real groom. I'll give you water from which you drink. You'll never be thirsty again. Here's the real deal, lady. Yes, indeed, and she became the bride of Christ. She stepped in and drank waters of life in Jesus and went off and told everybody in the Samaritan village, didn't she? Yeah, the bride of Christ drinks waters from her groom and king as he dispenses them through his word from heaven. Pure waters Now, we've already seen this series on Revelation that the waters that flow in this world, these gospel waters, are not always pure. We read of the third trumpet from the star that fell from heaven, who was Satan, caused the the springs and the fountains to become bitter, and people died from them. We found in the third bowl the waters became so polluted that they only delivered death, even though people drank of them, hoping that they would get life. And so we must recognize in this world, just because someone says, gospel, Jesus, church, life, it's fantastic, it's wonderful, blah, 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 doesn't mean it's pure waters. The waters can become compromised and polluted through heresy and distortion. These are the waters that come to us in the pure streams from Christ and bind us to Him in truth. These are the waters that quench the thirst of His bride in this world. And if we wait too late, if we wait too long, to drink of these waters, we will lose that opportunity altogether. And that's why we see that we must come to the waters and drink. And we'll learn more about that in just a moment. But before we do, John closes out this book here with words of warning, verses 18 and 19. I warn everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book, If anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues described in this book. 
And if anyone takes away from the words of this book, of this prophecy, God will take away from him his share in the tree of life and in the holy city, which are described in this book. You see, this is directed to us as the church of Jesus Christ. Now, scholars have identified these, this verses 18 and 19 as being a very typical document clause that was part and parcel and fixated to the covenant documents in the ancient Near East. And we find these document clauses are put in place to preserve the words of the covenant. And so we find that these very document clause here, now in the end of our Bibles, had already reappeared in Deuteronomy. Even the, the way it's worded, you can hear Deuteronomy chapter 4, Deuteronomy 12, Deuteronomy 29. Yes, Deuteronomy was constructed and structured after the ancient Near Eastern treaties between a king and his people. And so, too, we are in covenant with God, a king and his people, and he's given us his word, which are the words of the covenant. And now he has this document clause is saying, don't alter anything here. Don't think you can add to it and improve upon it now. Very serious outcomes to those who tamper with, by way of addition or subtraction, with the word of God. And we should be in no doubt the very character and the consequential importance of this book of Revelation as being a very solemn revelation from God and very solemn with regard to what we do with it. Not to tamper with it. If you add to it, God will add to you the plagues. If you subtract to it, God will subtract from you the right to the tree of life. Now what do these things mean? They mean at least two things. They mean, first of all, that we should not add our own rules for life in any sense of the word. We should not fail to observe what this word is saying, or not only not fail to observe, but fail to depart from these words. You can add or subtract to them by bringing in your own life that will cancel out what these words are saying. Your own ideas which will cancel out what these words are saying. Oh, it's okay. You know, it's, it's really okay if I don't keep the fourth command. It's okay if I you know, don't go to church every Sunday. That's okay. If I just go a few times every Sunday, that's okay. Well, you've just canceled out the Word of God. God calls us to a rhythm gathering with his people on a week, weekly basis. For you to now come to that word and say, no, I, I'm just going to do it once in a while. Well, you're adding and subtracting to the word of God. Very dangerous thing to do. Very unsafe. But there's also another sense that is here with regard to this word, not just uh, through its rank disobedience, but, but also this other sense, which is really very much on the surface of the text, kind of, you might say, the prima facie reading of it. Don't add to it or subtract to it. In other words, in other words you don't say, well, I'm, I'm going to throw out the book of Revelation because that's so hard to understand, but I'll hold to the other 65 books of the Bible. Or I don't like the Song of Solomon. Get rid of that one. You know. Or any other book, or any other portion. Or the other problem is adding to it. This comes at the end of our Bibles, doesn't it? This documental clause, don't add to it. And so we should see here a warning that I don't have the freedom to say, hey, I'm so in tune with God. My ears are so open to Him. I'm getting messages from the Lord, and you need to hear them. The idea seems to be proliferating in our day. You'd think by now we'd say, hey, that's clearly bogus. But no, it seems like it's becoming more and more popular. We should not, in any sense of the word, seriously think for a moment that Joseph Smith received any covenant from God 
by way of a revelation from Moroni the angel. It's always kind of fun to be personally quizzical on my part. I think that the angel Moroni sounds like moron. But maybe that's just coincidental. But this is completely contrary to what John is saying here. Don't add to the words. There isn't some other covenant of Jesus. This is the covenant. He's finished it. He's completed it. Don't add to it. And if you do, expect there to be serious consequences. Now, with this very severe warning, let us thank God this is not the end of the book of Revelation. Despite the severity of this warning at the end of potential curse for adding or subtracting to this book. But thankfully, we can come to the very last two verses, the end of the book, and to realize this book is written intentionally to bless your life. And it will only result in cursing if you buck it. But if you embrace it, that's its intention. He who testifies is he's saying, surely I'm coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with you all. Jesus is coming back. Amen. And the first and fundamental reason for his coming back is to gather you to himself for all eternity. That is blessing. The grand culmination and consummation of blessing of his bride to come back, to call her out of Babylon to himself as judgment falls upon this idolatrous, God-forsaken world. He will call out his people to himself, washed, raised, in union and communion with him forever and ever. So, amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Come, Lord Jesus, and bring this blessing of your presence physically. And in the meantime, we are encouraged to eagerly and believingly and lovingly and with true soldier-like perseverance, we are called here, are we not, into conclusion to fix our minds as Peter says, upon the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. He places his benediction upon us here to see us through. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with you all. That's in the meantime, to see you through. Yes, may his grace enable us to attend to his word, to hear it, and to keep it. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Amen. Let us pray.